very nice to see lots of familiar faces here this evening. Um, but for anyone who's not familiar with the Association of Jewish Refugees, we are the national charity supporting Britain's um, refugees and survivors of Nazi oppression. We are committed to the education of others about the Holocaust and our membership is open to members also of the second and third and fourth generations as well. I don't know if anybody saw, but yesterday there was a very nice article in the Observer newspaper about one of our members and the um, help that we are giving her. And one of the reasons that we are um, we welcome articles like this is that we are still open to uh, first generation members who need our help. So if you know of anyone who may be able to benefit, please do ask them to get in touch. And incidentally, that article we've just been told has been viewed over a third of a million times since yesterday. So hopefully we'll get some uh, referrals from people who are needing our help from that. So that's wonderful. Uh, my name is Deborah Barnes. I work for the AJR and I, uh, I run the My Story book project, which some of you might know about. And I'm also second generation myself. And I have written a book called The Young Survivors, which was inspired by my own family history. And coincidentally, Mary All and I are the same age and written books about the same sort of subject quite quite different uh, books uh, recently so we'll probably be talking about that later okay so our guest speaker today is Muriel Schindler welcome uh, we're very excited to have you here to talk about your book which I have a copy here called The Lost Cafe Schindler and as you can see oh this is where <laughs> I'm not sure I've got that but it's quite a very full history um, about your extended family, which you're going to be telling us about, but it's a, it's a really fantastic read and congratulations on it. Um, so let me tell you more about our speaker. Muriel spent the first 15 years of her life growing up in central London before suddenly being moved to a convent school in provincial Austria. Five years later, she moved back to the UK to study French and German at university and is now an employment lawyer, partner and head of a team at Withers LLP, a law firm. Muriel was also a trustee of Arvon, the writing charity, and she's married to her husband, Jeremy, and has three grown-up children. Let me just leave, let someone in. There we go. So, Muriel, welcome. Thank and I understand. And I understand you're going to read a couple of extracts to set the scene for us. Yes, thank you very, very much for welcoming in, me into your book club. As I saw all the names flashing up, I had all sorts of thoughts about who you might be and what you might be expecting from this evening. So I very much hope that, that you enjoy this. So um, it was actually quite difficult to choose, I suppose, a representative extract from the book not least because it's got lots and lots of different things and lots of different themes in it, ranging from, you know, detailed descriptions of the First World War that my grandfather fought on the Southern Front. So he was a Jew of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He fought loyally for his Kaiser in the mountains on the Southern Front against the Italians. Now that is a war that many of your forebears may have fought in, but it's not a war that is ever described in English history books. And that was a terrible, terrible war. And not, I wouldn't say worse than the wars in France, but in many ways, just as awful because it was fought on mountains. And it, so it contains that, it contains discussions about the Holocaust, but it also contains discussions of a cafe and recipes. So there's a wide range of stuff in there. Um, so I'm going to choose, what I've chosen is um, a little bit about my father, which is in the prologue. Um, some of you may have the book already, so it's it's the very the sort of third, literally starting on the first page, to set the scene a little bit, because this is a, 
a lot about my relationship with my father, this book. And I'll tell you a little bit about that now as I read. So I, I'm going to start now. So my father was called Kurt Schindler. I only remember Kurt holding down a job once, briefly in the 1970s. He hated being told what to do. And so he preferred to work for himself. He set up and ran multiple commodity trading companies, importing nuts, herbs, vitamin C supplements, jam and alcohol, and then reselling them, often at a loss. He had scant regard for the basics of accounting or regular commerce. Frequently, he would fail to pay his suppliers, in instead using whatever he earned from the resale to fend off or pursue litigation against those he believed had wronged him. When Kurt's companies co collapsed, as they inevitably did, engulfed in debt and litigation, he sought the help of lawyers and even psychiatrists to get himself out of the financial and legal mess in which he found himself. Like a compulsive gambler, he always promised never to trade again. But he invariably did claiming he had no choice. In one unusually perceptive moment, he admitted that he liked living on the edge. For him, the fact that his wife and children had to live there with him was simply how it was. As a father, Kurt failed to provide even the most basic stability. And so we, his family, lurched between extremes. At times we lived in expensive houses, rode in BMWs, attended upmarket private schools and stayed in fancy hotels. At others, we lived on our wits, dodging debt collectors, facing eviction and in due course fleeing abroad. Often those extremes coexisted. As a child, it was both exhilarating and bewildering. In the early 1970s, my younger sister, Sophie and I, were often left alone for days at a time while our parents drove around London visiting lawyers. We grew to fear the visits of the bailiff. I distinctly remember when I was about 10, hiding in the house as someone banged away on our front door. We had strict instructions not to open it when we were alone. So Sophie and La I lay quietly on the wooden floor upstairs trying not to breathe too loudly. I inched forward to the top of the spiral staircase and leaned my head over the edge of the first step so that I could see through the open tread of the steps down to the front door below. The metal flap on the letterbox rattled impatiently. I held my breath. And then in a moment of acute embarrassment, my eyes met another's eyes peering through. The figure outside was squatting down. He seemed as shocked as I was to see a young girl's face hanging upside down above him, and he left hurriedly. On this occasion, he'd failed in his mission to serve legal documents on my father. Bailiff zero, Schindler's one. Another delay in some never ending case that I never fully grasped. There you go. So that almost sounds quite exciting, childhood. <laughs> how, yeah. how, 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 looking back on it. What? Um, it's very different to the childhood that I wanted my children to have. Um, I became a nice middle-class professional lawyer and provided complete security for my children. Um, I mean, this was an incredibly turbulent childhood. It was as if the trauma that he experienced as a 13 year old when he had to flee from Austria to London was being relived again in my generation because we fled, surprisingly enough perhaps, back to Austria and we fled because we were being pursued by creditors. So it was as if that trauma was almost reliving itself and, you know, on, on up and, and being inflicted on us, if you like. So, and you said um, he, he sought the help of lawyers. 
Do you think that had an influence on you becoming a lawyer? Almost certainly. I, I mean, I have to say I swore as soon as I could understand what was going on, I swore that I would never be financially dependent on my parents as soon as I could. I earned my own money. Um, but also I thought that if you needed lawyers so badly as my father clearly did at all at all turns, that um, being a lawyer would prevent me being in that predicament. So I think at a very basic level, it probably did influence me. Mm. And how was your relationship with your father? I feel I should be lying down on a couch <laughs> when you ask this. Um, I, so when I was a small child, I adored him. He was tall, he was handsome, he was charismatic, he told jokes, he told anecdotes. He was fantastic. He was incredibly loving, a little bit verging on the obsessive side, but he was very loving. And um, I, I did, you know, that was an incredibly loving relationship. But I, as I grew older, I suddenly realized what was going on. And the fact that he was forever running up debts and not paying them. And I knew that wasn't right. So my relationship became, let me just make sure my son isn't practicing violin in my background. Jack, I'm on a copy that. I apologise, that's my son about to practice music, so I hadn't warned him, he's just got back from school, apologies. Um, so as I grew up, he, he, I realised that that wasn't a normal way of going about things, and, um, and I be it became a very fractious relationship and a very estranged relationship. So by the time he died, age 91 in 2017, I was pretty much estranged from him. I... I found it very difficult to be in his company for the simple reason that he was always asking for legal advice from me, often in areas that I knew nothing about. But then he wouldn't take the advice, even if I gave it to him. He always wanted to go a different path, but to be for me to somehow approve of what he did, which I didn't. So it was a very difficult relationship as an adult. Mm -hmm. So and but how do you feel about the relationship now? Um. When he died, I was quite angry um, still. And I think that there is something about ordering your thoughts and writing things down. Um, and I think it's part of your, your story project in many ways that, that there's something very powerful about committing the story to paper. And it's not just about passing it on to future generations, although that is part of it. Um, it is also the fact that it allows you to order your thoughts and come to conclusions. And I'm an enormous believer in the in the curative power of writing and that it helps you heal from trauma. And is that something that um, you learned from the writing charity? Or is that something you knew before? Yes, I think, I mean, Arvon, I don't know how many of your members know about Arvon. It's a, it's a wonderful charity. It's a, um, you know, I'm a trustee, so I, I, I say that in advance. Um, it, it, it owns three very historic houses, all, all with literary connections. And it is a, a time to, it's a, it's a space where you can be away from your daily life and can learn the craft of writing. So it's a very important space and lots of really, you know, really impressive books have been written in, in their houses. Mm. And you went there yourself, I believe. Yeah. Yes, I did indeed, I did yeah. indeed. Yeah, so I know um, you've said you, in, you enjoy the legal disputes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And in your book, you write a lot about um, when you were doing your research, you would go to the archives and get huge boxes full of papers. And yeah. That, and you, and uh, I know that 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 didn't daunt you. So being a lawyer must have helped with that part of the. I think there were two process. things that helped. First of all, I speak German, which is thanks to being removed at the age of 15 to Austria when I, I spoke barely a word of German when I arrived and I had to learn pretty darn quick in order to progress at school. Um, so I think there were two things that helped, but I think being a lawyer did mean that I wasn't frightened of piles of documents. Um, you know, when the archivist brings you one of those metal trolleys 
piled high with archive files. I wasn't remotely frightened of that. So piling through documents didn't bother me. And I think I, I also am not fri frightened of hard work, to be honest. So, you know, working through documents didn't worry me at all. Um, I mean, some of the documents, it, it's, I mean, artifacts are interesting and papers are very interesting, particularly original papers, because to have in your hands, you know, the Gestapo list of Jews who were rounded up in Linz and seeing it being amended in, you know, with different ticks in different crayon, you know, red crayons and then blue crayons and crossings out, you, you know, you know what has happened to that piece of paper and to what's happened on the to the people on the paper. So there's something incredibly powerful about looking at original documents and and that th there's a real art, you know, eloquence to the artifacts that you you come across in this sort of process. So when you went to the archives, they actually gave you the original yes. documents. Yes. So we've had a question, someone's asking, Lynn's asking, where are the archives or what were the archives that you went to? So I went to quite a lot of archives. Um, so for the First World War, um, I had I went to one in Vienna, which is called the Kriegsarchiv, so the, the war archives, which is in a huge building on sort of the outskirts of Vienna. Um, and there are amazing documents there. So I found there uh, my grandfather's um, cadet, sort of basically like school reports of his cadet time in the army when he was 16, 17 and descriptions of him, what he was like as a young man. And I never met my grandfather, so that was very powerful and very important for me. Um, so that was amazing. Um, then in Innsbruck, there were lots of archives. So um, there was a city archive with a lot of history of the cafe itself in it, photographs I'd never seen before, documents I'd never seen before, things like the, the planning permission documents for every time they extended the cafe, put in another ballroom, etc. Amazing documents, um, unfolding the plans for the original cafe and seeing them being, you know, them ticking off things like the health and safety aspects, which as a lawyer I'm interested in, of course, you know, ventilation and places for people to spit because you know, tuberculosis was still rife. All of those sorts of things are really interesting. And the, the care with which that plan is drawn by someone who wants to, you know, wants to open a beautiful cafe. I think those things are very amazing. The scarier archives were, of course, the uh, state archives, which have all the paperwork from when my grand, my grandfather was that very badly beaten up on Kristallnacht on, in, on, during the pogrom of, of, of November 38. And there was a prosecution after the war, just after the war of those who beat up my grandfather. And reading those statements, you know, you need to go and wash your hands afterwards because you're thinking these are people who are just lying through their teeth to get out of being prosecuted. And then the restitution files are also very interesting because they have piles and piles of letters in them going backwards and forwards and statements of each side putting their case. And you would think, would you not, that it would be darn easy to get assets back through restitution proceedings um, at the end of the war. Um, but of course, you know, actually it wasn't at all easy and people fought incredibly long and hard. I mean, often over a decade or more to get assets back. And these files document the arguments going backwards and forwards. And those are sometimes very interesting arguments, particularly in my family's case. So you would just talk about, um, I just, uh, something I picked up. Let me see if I can find it. Hold on. So when um, you're talking about the restitution uh, yeah. after the war and everything, and I was just, I made a note about when your father returned, I don't know if I'm jumping a bit, but anyway, when your father returned to see Hoffer, perhaps you can tell us who Hoffer, Hoffer yeah, I don't right. know if I'm pronouncing his name right, yes. um, who lived in in the villa, didn't he, yes. in the war. So I'll, I'll explain a little bit. So yeah, there were, thanks. my father, my, my family, my my grandfather's family were well to do, you know, reasonably well off Jews, very assimilated in the Tyrol in Western Austria. Now, the Tyrol is unusual because it actually had hardly any Jews in it at all. Um, Innsbruck itself had maybe 500 Jews. This is very, very different to what was going on in Vienna in the east of Austria. 
So the Viennese, the Jewish population of Vienna was about 10%, many of whom were incredibly poor. There was a housing crisis. There was all sorts of things going on before the Second World War. Um, but in, but in, I mean, indeed before the First World War, um, but in, in, in the Western part of Austria, there were very, very few Jews and they were largely assimilated and they were business people and they ran cafes and furniture shops and department stores. You know, they were traders, they were, they were the mercantile class. Um, so after 1938, uh, after the Anschluss, um, when Austria was annexed uh, by Germany, um, a chap called Franz Hofer arrived, who was the Gauleiter. He was, you know, there were 42 of these and he reported directly to Hitler. And because my, my family had the nicest house in town, uh, they had a beautiful villa, he decided he was going to move in to that villa. And um, just before, so before he moved in, when he was scouting as to which house he wanted to move into, he knocked on the door. Uh, my father was home alone. He was, he was 12 at the time. And so he opened the door and on the doorstep stands the Gauleiter. My father has no idea, he's a child, has no idea who he is. And um, Gauleiter Hofer says, well, could I have a look around? My father is utterly overwhelmed by good manners and uh, says, yes. So he has his hair ruffled by this Nazi, this leading Nazi, and my father shows him around the house. And sure enough, a few months later, uh, he, my grandfather is required to sell the house at a huge undervalue to the Gauleiter. Um, who moves in with his family, and our family obviously moves out. And then your father goes back and visits him. Um, ah, well, my father, because he he <laughs> he liked to follow things up, shall we say? Um, so the Gauleiter Hofer was a wanted man at the end of the war. He um, he he escaped justice. That is not a spoiler. You can look that one up. Um, and he he was very um, he was very persistent. My father, very bright man, and Gauleiter Hofer goes into hiding in northern Germany, and he my father finds out where he is, not least because people in Innsbruck, his friends, know where Gauleiter is, and my father drives the five hundred kilometers to knock on the Gauleiter's door um, after the war, and he's standing there as a young man in his early 20s obviously very different to the 12 year old that the Gauleiter had first met and the Gauleiter opens the door he's obviously the ex-Gauleiter of the Tyrol uh, opens the door to my father and says well who are you and my father says well my name is Kurt Schindler and obviously the Gauleiter is somewhat surprised to be tracked down by uh, my father and he's my father asked to come in and my father used to tell this story regularly and the Gauleiter, the ex Gauleiter, invites him in um and my father they sit down and they engage in some chit chat they're both austrians so there's some common ground between this ex-leading nazi who carried on being a nazi by the way and my father who was jewish um and they make this sort of chit chat about Austria and you know how is the Tyrol and how is Innsbruck and how is the cafe going um, and eventually my father works up to his actual request which is quite a nice thing if you paid us rent for the seven years that you lived in our house and um, the Gauleiter is obviously somewhat surprised by this but in some ways can understand what where this request is coming from he's a bit short of money so he says he'll come up with a bit of money obviously the threat that my father holds over him is that he'll tell the Innsbruck authorities exactly where he is um so the Gauleiter comes up with some money and gives my father some money he was always short of money and then he invites my father for dinner now this is extraordinary of course because you know five ten years previously he'd have shipped him off to a camp so they, he sits down for dinner and his, the Gauleiter's wife, ex-Gauleiter's wife, brings in basically their, their, a kind of pasta, filled pasta, which in Austrian German has a particular name, but it has a very different name in German German. And the Austrians always have this tension with the Germans about language and many other things. And 
the wife announces this the name of this dish in her German way, and Gauleiter Hofe immediately snaps at her. Oh, these bloody Germans, they never get us, do they? These us Austrians, so he's siding with my father, us Austrians, we know what this dish is really called, and snaps at his wife. And my father always roared with laughter about the fact that you know this Nazi, ex-Nazi or Nazi was you know siding with him against his wife. And so they formed the oddest dining club probably in the world. My father would regularly turn up at Gauleiterhofer's house to extract a little bit more rent from him. They would have dinner, they would share a glass of very nice white wine, and then my father would go again. And he never bothered to tell the Innsbruck authorities where the Gauleiter was. Really incredible story. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bizarre story. <laughs> So I think we should probably talk something about the star of the book, the uh, the cafe itself. Um, so can you tell us uh, a little bit about the cafe? So, the, so as I said, my grandfather Hugo fought in the First World War, and he had a number of identities. Obviously, he was a Jew, but he was an assimilated Jew. He was a citizen of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And most importantly of all, he was a Tiroler. He was born in the mountains. He loved the mountains. I have photograph after photograph of him walking the mountain trails, walking across glaciers. He adored the mountains. So of his sort of three identities, you know, Austro-Hungarian, Jewish, Tirola, I think that the, the, the Tirola one was the one that was closest to his heart. So when he returned from the First World War, um, Austria was in crisis. Uh, I mean, it was bankrupt basically as a country. And um, he decides in 1922, they, they already have a family distillery business. That's the business he returns to run uh, with, his, with his brother. But they have they he decides that what he wants to do is set up a cafe, so a retail business, partly to sell the schnapps and wines and stuff that they bring in. Um, but also because I think he thinks it's a great idea. And he, in his head, there's clearly an idea about a classic Viennese coffee house where people will meet, they will socialize, and he will serve fantastic coffee and beautiful cake. And so in 1922 on the main street in Innsbruck, he opens the Café Schindler with his brother Erich. And it is a roaring success. So it's actually quite an audacious thing to do because the country is still pretty bankrupt and you know where people are gonna find the money to come dancing, I don't know. But in some ways it is this oasis of, of beauty and, and, and fun in the middle of what was a very dark period in, in, in Austrian history. Um, and they are enormously successful in the cafe. It is the first place in where, or practically the first place in Western Austria where you hear jazz. Um, and they won awards for their cakes. And as it succeeded, they extended it. They had not one, but two ballrooms. They had a room to play bridge in. They had a billiard room. They had this beautiful cafe on the first floor. And downstairs, they had a shop where they sold cakes and candy fruit and chocolates and things like that. So it was the whole building of a sort of triple, triple fronted facade, basically, on the main street in Innsbruck. And I was going to read you a little bit about, about it. And I, then I'll explain why I think the cafe, in a sense, is the main character in the book. So this is um, uh, the, from, the, from, in fact, the chapter entitled Apfelstrudel, which for all of those who speak German know that that's Apfelstrudel. Innsbruck 2018. Even today, I have conversations with misty-eyed Innsbruckers who remember tales told by their parents or grandparents of courtship and dancing at the Café Schindler. Frequently, I return to a cloth-covered album I have which is devoted to photographs of the cafe. I've looked at it so often that I feel I can quite easily insert myself into that time and place. First, I wander down, I wander from the Marie Theresienstrasse into the retail shop on the ground floor. 
where they sell handmade chocolates and candied fruit in hinged wooden boxes branded with the S. Schindler name. I go up the broad polished wooden staircase in the corner, which leads up to the first floor. That's where the cafe is. Perhaps Hugo Schindler himself is there to greet customers, a proud and congenial patron. A tail-coated waiter takes my coat and ushers me to a bonquette at right angles to the window. I have a view of the street below me, the Anna Soyla statue, and above all the mountains, which rise up dredged in snow to the right of my field of vision. I order coffee and contemplate the cakes that sit behind a curved glass vitrine. Apfelstrudel, Apfelstrudel, Topfenstrudel, Cream Cheese Strudel, Mohnkuchen, Poppy Seed Cake, Linzer Torte, Hazelnut and Red Currant Jam Cake, Topfentorte, Baked Cheesecake, and Gugelhupf. This last is a plain or chocolate marbled sponge cake with distinctive ridges and a hole in the middle. And of course, there is Sacher Torte, an unauthorized version far away from the capital. Santol, the main patissier, knows he can serve it as long as he does not call it the original Sacher Torte. The coffee arrives served on a metal tray. It is placed discreetly on the, on the starched linen tablecloth in front of me, accompanied by a glass of water to counteract its dehydrating effect. Sugar cubes are piled into small bowls to be extracted with small tongs. Tiny, handleless white jugs hold the cream. Slices of cake are lifted gently with a triangular cake slice and placed on a plate with care. The stakes are high. If they topple over, it is, according to Austrian folklore, certain that an evil mother-in-law waits. Assuming the customer has escaped this, the fate, the cake is decorated with whipped, slightly sweetened cream or schlag. But I've not chosen a high-rise cake, but the cafe's signature dish, Apfelstrudel, with its exquisitely thin layers of crisp pastry, holding in their middle slices of apple, nuts, breadcrumbs and cinnamon. The acidity of the apples is offset by the buttery pastry, lightly dusted with icing sugar. I take in my surroundings. The cafe hums with conversation. The atmosphere is relaxed and understated. As a guest on my own, I'm free to while away several hours over a cup of coffee, if I wish, perhaps reading the newspapers which are stretched each day onto wooden batons and hung up near the door. No one dreams of hurrying me on. Jazz has already made its debut in the Tyrol in 1922 at the Hotel Sonne. The Café Schindler is quick to pick up on the latest trends. And on the 10th of March 1923, Hugo Schindler announces the opening of his dance café, a salon café, five o'clock tea with music. It is so successful that by January 25, as the Innsbrucker Nachrichten announces, music is on the menu every day until 2 a.m. The newspaper also reveals that Mr. Constant from the Schwatt Dance School will lead the dancing, and that from the 15th of January onwards, the jazz band Saar Seidel will play. This new music is a hit, and Hugo ensures there's always plenty of jazz to be heard at the cafe. Young couples hold hands over the tables and whirl on the dance floors of the second and later third stories of the building. Tango, foxtrot, swing and American big band music stream from the open windows on summer evenings. Soon Innsbruck's younger women start appearing at the cafe in daring knee-length dresses with bobbed hair. Sometimes they dance with each other. After all, in these post-war years, there is a deficit of young men. Occasionally, there's an all-female orchestra. It's not New York or Paris. It's not even Vienna. But from the detritus of war, the Café Schindler is creating for Tyrolians in miniature their very own jazz age. Well, I feel like I was there. But that was very mean of you to uh, describe the cake. <laughs> Are you all hungry? <laughs> for dinner. 
and and I should add there are there are recipes in the back of the book as well. I believe there are there are four. I haven't I haven't tried any of them. Uh, how's your baking? How are your baking skills, Mariel? <laughs> Um, we had to test because I do I do bake, but obviously putting them in a book is another matter. So we did retest them. In fact, my middle daughter was in charge of retesting and checking all the ingredients and the you know the because I do things a lot by by eye and by guesswork. And she's like, no, you can't do that, Mum. You've got to you've got to measure the stuff. So um, no, they are they have been retested by her. So yes, the the the, the proportions are accurate. Oh, well, I look forward to trying them out. <laughs> I'm not much of a baker, although I did some during lockdown, I have to say. So. It's a good lockdown, <laughs> lockdown sort of yeah. um, diversion. As uh, Yeah, as most people could probably have a go. And um, someone's asked a question. Val has asked um, the the address of the of the cafe. Um, was it Mar Mar it's Maria Theresenstrasse, so Maria Theresenstrasse. Yeah, which In number? Name. Sorry? Which number? <laughs> ah, so it gets renumbered, I think. So it's 29 or 31, depending on which which time you're looking at, basically. Okay, okay. But well, it's, it's mostly 29, I think I've got. Um, I hope that answers the question. And obviously you talk a lot about jazz and everything, and um, I hope you don't mind me. Which is the one of the early pictures. Yeah. That's 29. Later, I think it's 31, but I never worked out why. Oh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, no, I was going to say, so you talk a lot about jazz and everything. So, um, and, and I believe one of your children has chosen uh, a career. Yeah, so the, 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 the son that you were just about to hear strike up, which is just about to warm up, um, is, a, is going off to study jazz. And one of the things I particularly love about that uh, is, of course, the fact that jazz was banned by the Nazis. And I think that there's something rather special about um, this, you know, great grandson of Hugo Schindler, who clearly loved jazz, now going to study jazz for four years at Guildhall School of Music and Drama. And I think that's rather lovely. Yes, yes, that is very nice, very nice. So um, clearly the um, the cafe, uh, oh, I believe you have some, 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 some objects from the cafe that, that you grew up so with. Yes. So when when I was growing up, I knew we'd had a cafe. And in fact, these were the actual cups that we used growing up. So you'll see on there that this is a, a classic European coffee cup, in a sense. Um, and I never really paid much attention to it. I knew we'd had a cafe. I knew we no longer had a cafe. Clearly, we used to drink our hot chocolate out of this cup. Now, when the Nazis arrived, I've described how the villa was taken away, but obviously the cafe was also taken away, as was the distillery, etc. And um, the chap who went, was installed by the Nazis to run the cafe knew he was onto a good thing. He loved the idea of running the cafe in many ways. Um, and rather than rebrand in any sort of grand way, I mean, he, he called it Café Hebel, not Café Schindler. He was called Franz Hebel. But you will notice something strikingly similar about uh, the cups that he used. So he kept exactly the same branding. All that he did was um, change the S to an H and the Schindler to Hebel. So, so good was the branding that my grandfather came up with that the Nazis couldn't improve on it. Um, so he ran the cafe for seven years, but he was quite a dark fellow in many ways, because aside from being a Nazi, obviously, um, he engaged in quite extensive black marketeering. So as, as the war you know, went progressively less well, and there, was few, there were fewer luxury goods on the market, and because the cafe was an upmarket place, he used to go on long trips into Holland, which was less affected by the war because it was a later acquisition into the Reich. And he would buy gin and wine and chocolate, silk stockings and even jellied eels and bring them to the cafe to keep his clientele happy. Now, the, the Germans, as we all know, had very, very 
uh, strict rules about these sorts of things. And in fact, black marketeering was a capital offence. And when the Nazis worked out what he was doing, they uh, decided that they would try him for it. So he was arrested and he was put in prison and he was tried. And it's a capital offence, as I said, so he could have been shot by the firing squads that were used to deal with black marketeers. But so important was the cafe to morale that Himmler intervened to save this chap's life and to keep the cafe going. And instead of being um, you know, put in front of a firing squad, he actually just served two weeks at the front, survived that, came back and opened the, reopened the cafe. So it, it was as if the cafe intervened to save his life because you know it was an important institution and important for the morale of the people of Innsbruck and indeed all the visitors um, to Innsbruck. So um, it is a brilliant story. I mean, uh, if anybody hasn't read it yet, please do read it. The, I mean, the question, the the example I just gave of of Hoffa with your with your father going back to visit him. Is it Hoffa? Yeah. Um, which someone actually made uh, just wrote a comment saying, "What a brilliant story!" I mean, it's just full, full of of stories like that. And um, if there's time, I'll ask you to tell the one about the doctor um oh, yeah. but if but you know it's amazing because apparently there are two holocaust books or books on the holocaust um printed every published every day um <laughs> these days yeah i mean I've, I've done it you've done it everybody everybody's doing it, well, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> but um i mean for me, it was a, a way, it was a tribute to my family. I think, uh, you know, you, you had your reasons as well. Do you think it's, this is a good way to, to remember and, and inform about the Holocaust or how do you think um, we should best? So when, I'll start by answering the question slightly indirectly, if I may. Um, when I was at school in Innsbruck as a 15 year old, no one talked about the war. I would not have dreamt of going to a friend's house and asking what the parents or grandparents did in the war. I just, it would just have been so impolite. So no one talked about the war. And um, nowadays people do, and I think Germany in particular has made enormous progress in dealing with its past. It made progress far faster than Austria did. So Austria, I'm afraid was, um, much as I love Austria, uh, <laughs> was dreadful about dealing with, with its past. Um, despite the flag waving crowds when Hitler arrived, it immediately claimed that it was Hitler's first victim. And that was the story that for generations was trotted out. And whenever anyone raised any stories or any issues or any recollections of the 66,000 Jews who died, Austrian Jews who died, it was always, well, we suffered too. And that was basically what, what the story was for a very long time, until about 10, 15 years ago, when the younger generation of historians came to the fore and started saying, this is just not good enough. And I think since then, they ha Austrians have dealt with the past better. It is by no means perfect. Um, and I am no apologist for that, by the way. It is by no means perfect, but an awful lot has now been done in the last 10 to 15 years. And you asked about, in a sense, my view of, of why I wrote the book. Well, I wrote the book, it started as, I'm a bit of an accidental author, it has to be said, because I started this off as a private project for my children to, in a sense, try and understand my past and to put names to the photos that I had inherited. And, um, once I'd started doing that and un started unraveling all these stories, I became rather obsessed with the whole thing. And my husband eventually said, for goodness sake, write a proper book, because, you know, <laughs> there's so much to this story and there's so many bits to it. Write the whole thing down. And and that's why I did it. And I, and I, and I slightly to my surprise, find myself as a published author as a result. So anyway, I mean, the. The, the point that I was trying to make about the cafe itself is that 
how we now go about dealing with this incredibly important history is important. Austria dealt with it very badly. My wish for this book is that it forms part of that effort to remember what happened and to tell the story in a slightly different way. So this is a story about a cafe. It is one of the main characters in the book. It is set up by a Jew. It is taken over by a Nazi who nearly gets himself shot. It is returned to a Jew at the end of the war. But the second generation Jew, my father was a lousy businessman, as we've heard, he had he sold the cafe, but it lived on in people's memories. And when a someone who was completely unconnected to my family decided to open a cafe 10 years ago in Innsbruck in the exact same building, he was talking to people about it and everyone around him said, it's got to be called Cafe Schindler. He'd never even heard of us. He goes to the local archives, he types in our name and he realises he has a nearly hundred year history on his hands. So he decks it out in Art Deco style and the Cafe Schindler is now back on the main high street. And that story arc of loss, regaining loss and being back, in some ways I, I like as a story arc. Yes, OK, we don't own that cafe anymore. I don't mind. I don't want to run a cafe in Innsbruck. But the fact it's there and the fact it is the only Jewish business that is still there 100 years later means a lot to me personally. And I think it says a lot about the story and it's a way of telling the story of the Holocaust through a slightly different prism. It's a story of resilience. It's a story of brutality. But it's also a story about joy and music and cake. It's a lot of things and it's a different way of telling the story. So that's why I think it's part of the picture. Mm. And as, as we at the AJR, AJR know that there's always, well, if there's food involved, then uh, there's always, it's always good. <laughs> a crowd behind it. So that's great. Um, we've had a question here. Who's asked, David Freeman's asked, how did you come to be in a convent? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, it, it just happened to be the, the upmarket school in, in Innsbruck. So that's where they stuck me. I mean, I was the only, the only foreigner in it. I didn't speak a word of German and I was certainly the only non-Catholic or practically the only non-Catholic in it. So it was a, it was an extraordinary experience. I mean, I was taught by nuns for the last three years of my secondary school education. It was quite something. Because there are, there is a very small, there always was a very small Jewish population, as you said. In it's tiny. I mean, when my when my forebears moved, my great grandfather moved to Innsbruck. There wasn't even a shul. There's, you know, there is now one, but you know, all the through the time that my grandfather was there as a as a young man and growing up, there wasn't there wasn't a synagogue. There was a prayer room, but there was no synagogue, no mm. rabbi. And they loved it so much. They loved the mountains. How, do you? Did you? Yes, inherit that? yes, absolutely. I love the mountains. So um, there haven't been any further questions at the moment. So why don't you just quickly tell us about Edward? So this is a little bit of a side plot uh, in, in it. So one, my father was a great anecdote teller, as you know. One of the things he used to do is claim relationships, family relationships with a whole host of very famous people. So we were related to Franz Kafka, we were related to Adolf, um, Adel Bloch-Bauer, the woman in gold, the Klimt painting. We were related to a whole host of people. Uh, Bruno Kreisky, he was another one. And I mean, basically after a while as a teenager, you sort of go, yeah, really? <laughs> Where's the evidence? He also claimed to be related to Oskar Schindler. Now, in terms of order of events, we are very, 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 very distant related to Franz Kafka. I mean, it's so distant, you really wouldn't ever, ever claim it. Um, Oscar Schindler, I can find no evidence for whatsoever. We are called Schindler, but that's it. Um, Bruno Kreisky, so, so distant again, ridiculous. Adele Blochbauer, so distant again, it's so, it's ridiculous. But the most, the funniest one and the weirdest one he used to claim was that his 
great uncle was a Jewish doctor in Linz in Upper Austria, and that in 1907, so before the First World War, he treated Clara Hitler, Hitler's mum. And the story used to go that one day this middle-aged woman appeared in Dr. Bloch's surgery in Linz, complaining of excruciating pain in her chest. Now, Dr. Bloch was a good doctor. He'd done a specialism in women's medicine, and he pretty much guessed that there was something very amiss. He examined her, established that she had breast cancer, and said, Frau Hitler, could you please uh, return in a couple of days' time with your family, and I will explain what is what needs to happen. He sent her away with some painkillers, and two or three days later, Clara Hitler came back to his surgery with young 17-year-old Adolf in tow. The good doctor explains what the problem is and that Clara Hitler will have to go undergo a mastectomy and Hitler, Adolf Hitler is in tears. He clearly adores his mother. Dr. Bloch explains all of this in his memoir. And um, a few days later, she is operated on, she has a double mastectomy and she makes a reasonable recovery, but you know, eventually does die. And Dr. Bloch describes how distraught um, Adolf Hitler is and how he sat with his mother's body all night and drawn, drawn her at the, on her deathbed um, and how at the end of all of this, Adolf comes and pays the doctor's bill and says, I will be eternally grateful to you. The Hitler family will be eternally grateful to you. He's 17 or 18, 19 at the time. Okay, so we all know what happens after that. He goes to Vienna, doesn't get into art school, etc. becomes an anti-Semite. Um, what he did from Vienna, however, when he supported himself by painting postcards, was he sent a couple of postcards to Dr. Bloch. These were hand-painted postcards, which he'd held up in front of a gas fire to create a sort of pleasing antique quality to them, as Dr. Bloch describes it. So he sent them and he carried on saying, you know, dear Dr. Bloch, you know, thank you so much for all your help and I will be eternally grateful. So he had a couple of these postcards, uh, which Dr. Bloch kept as a memento from a grateful patient. Why wouldn't you? Uh, roll on to 1938 and the Nazis arrive in Linz. Hitler is particularly obsessed with Linz. It is his favourite town. He hates Vienna, but he loves Linz. He has grand plans for Linz to build enormous museums full of stolen art, etc. Anyway, so he arrives and he says, is my, good, is my good house doctor still alive? And he's told, yes, Dr. Bloch is still alive. Ah, he says, if only all Jews were like him, we would have no problem with the Jews. Anyway, so this is the story that my father used to tell me. And I've, yeah, is it, how likely is it that Hitler had a Jewish doctor? Well, the answer is yes, he did. And yes, he was his he was his great uncle. So yes, we are distantly related to him. In, um, and he he was he was related to us. Um, and it's an extraordinary story because Dr. Bloch becomes obsessed with these cards. The Nazis arrive, knock on the door, and say, "Look, can we have can we have the cards for safekeeping? They belong, you know, they're part of the Führer's sort of cult. Uh, we'd like to have the cards." And the, his Dr. Bloch's wife hands them over. And Dr. Bloch spends a lot of the rest of his time in Linz trying to convince the Gestapo to give back his postcards. He even goes and visits the head of the Gestapo because he's obsessed with these cards and wants them back. So you can imagine a Jew walking voluntarily into the headquarters of the Gestapo to say, look, I quite like my postcards back. They came from the Führer, you know. Um, actually, the head of the Gestapo doesn't actually know that he's Jewish at this point. So he sits him down and says, you know, walk, greets him warmly, says, you know, I know, I know that you treated the Fuhrer, that's wonderful. And um, he says, I don't understand why we took the cards off you. I mean, are you in some way politically sus sus suspect? And Dr. Bloch says, no, I have been entirely devoted to my patients. And suddenly it dawns on this Nazi that he has a Jew sitting in front of him, at which point he's like, oh my God, you know, I've got this Jew sitting in front of me. Um, and 
he says, I, I will look into the postcards. And there's this awkward moment where he stands up and he, he, he can't quite shake his hand because it's a Jew. And Dr. Bloch says, it's OK, you can shake my hand. The Fuhrer shook it many times in gratitude and he's forced to shake his hand. And it's a lovely story. And I mean, this is all in Dr. Bloch's memoir, which is in the um, Holocaust Museum in Washington, mm -hmm. which he wrote out in 1940. He escaped late. He was one of the last Jews to leave alive. He left with a few possessions, not many, but more than most people left with. And he escaped to New York where he died in, in the late 40s. Yeah, amazing story. Actually, I, I, I've got a, a similar story in my family where, where my uncle went to the uh, head of Gestapo in, in Poitiers and uh, brave people, brave people who did this. Yeah. Um, right. We've had a it's not a question and it's quite long, but I'm going to read it. OK, and I think then we will um, have to call it a night. Um, sorry, I don't know who's this from. Uh, Jackie Hobson. Here we go, Jackie reading this for you uh, my grandparents had two shoe shops right by sorry deborah to interrupt you that the second comment is from jackie oh. that first is from val who asked the question about what oh, number sorry. Oh, i'm God. sorry i've confused you the way i sent it on <laughs> apologies val? sorry apologies my gra val's grandparents had two shoe shops right by on the same side of the cafe then yeah Pash and Pash, I was going to say they're the Pash shoe shops. Yes, and shoe house Corso, either uh -huh. side of the still uh, extant um, Tyrolia bookshop. Yes, my great uncle Friedrich Pash had. I'm terrible with these names. Had a textile shop a couple of doors further along, also on the same street, and the family lived on the street at yeah. Anichstrasse, overlooking yeah. the side of the That's street. It. That's perpendicular to perpendicular to the Mauritius yeah. And the thing that changed the approach in Austria to their Nazi era conduct con, conduct began when the 1938 asset files were discovered in numerical order in boxes in the Vienna basement. Once they were put in alphabetical order, Austria was forced to begin to confront what material goods had been stolen from whom. Fascinating. I didn't know about the renumbering of the files. That's amazing. And my grandparents show shops. Shoe shop. Oh, shoe, yes, thank you. It's, it's, it would be shoe shops. Uh, they were they were still shoe shops in, in 2003 when she visited Baker. And, yeah. and Jackie said, oh, I understand your anger at Kurt because of your cha chaotic childhood. However, as a listener, it's hard not to find him admirable, especially with the story that we told um, about Hoffa. He was charming and he was utterly charming, but it, it just, you know, he went to jail when I was 13, um, yeah. you know, and he came out of jail absolutely not understanding what he'd done wrong. You know, he, he you know, he went to jail for fraud. Um, but never understood that you know you needed to pay people that you bought goods from yeah it's kind of basic you know yeah. very difficult okay lovely well i think we'll we'll uh, we'll wrap up there but thank you so much one last um show of the book if you haven't seen it the lost cafe schindler available from all good bookshops um and amazon <laughs> as i like to say Definitely independent very, it will keep you going for a while. Um, I have to admit, I haven't finished it yet because you just can't read it quickly. I just, you know, I just want to take everything in. And there's so much, there's so much to learn about. So it's it's absolutely fascinating. Congratulations again Thank you. on your book. And it's been really um, lovely. And everybody's on chat is saying thank you for an interesting session so and recommends your book so that's lovely oh thank you well thank you very much everyone um it's been an absolute pleasure to visit you albeit via zoom but maybe that's sort of the way it is now um if that that is the one of the photo albums that i inherited and it's full chock-a-block full of pictures of the cafe um some of which you will see in the book 
Um, so it's, it's very, very nice to um, be here. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Have a good evening.